Good morning, everybody. No, you ain't here. You know, let's go. Feel like a gift. seem very interested, that's a good thing, because we're talking about something that affects all of us in here, all right? We're talking about an animal that's so important that our country deemed it fit to put it on our coat of arms. You guys know what the coat of arms is, right? Yes. All right, so that conch has a prominent position on our coat of arms because it is relatively the lifeblood of this nation, all right? Why do you think the conch is so important? Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, we make food with it. I mean, that's the long and short of it, really. Uh, and you could eat it, yeah. Make money. That's that's a big part of it too. It's very lucrative industry for the Bahamas. Okay. Now the conch. To get into a little bit of its biology, do you guys know? Well, you're probably a little young to know what it uh, about its uh, animal kingdom classification. You guys are familiar with that? animal kingdom, right, as a whole. It's how we classify the different animals because there's many animals in the world, all right? But the conch falls into a class that we call gastropod. Now, a lot of the animals all over the world, they have been given these uh, taxonomy names, all right, uh, to be able to classify them because there's so many species. We give them multiple names and put them in different categories so we can specify which type it is. So falling into the gastropod uh, classification, uh, that means stomach foot. Now a lot of these words that we use in science are either of Greek or Latin origin, okay? Pod means foot, gastro means stomach. How do conchs move along the seabed? Like when you see a conch moving, how does it move? They, yeah, it helps them. That cord is known as the operculum, okay? I'm gonna give y'all a lot of interesting words y'all remember to take home so y'all know the operculum is the name of that horn, all right? But yeah, they move on their stomachs, hence the name gastropod, stomach foot, okay? So they slide along their bellies, okay? So that helps us to classify them a little bit better. Now they fall into a phylum known as mollusk. The phylum is another degree of classification. Now, mollusk means sea snail, okay? So, the mollusk phylum is the second largest, I believe, phylum in the entire world. So that means that group of organisms that consists in that phylum is so large, there's over about 90,000 classifications of mollusk in the world, okay? 50 to 50,000 of the 50,000 to 55,000 being marine oriented, all right? And, uh, marine, I mean sea, okay? Because you also have freshwater mollusks and then you have land mollusks, okay? A perfect example of a land mollusk would be a tree snail, those snails that you see slide along uh, outside, okay? But 50 to 55,000 sea snails, okay? Now we know the different types of conch. I don't want to lose any of you now. I see a browse getting furrowed and stuff. So I'll try to keep it simple. The sea snail that we're talking about today is the queen conch, okay? Now we have tons of different types of conch in the Bahamas, okay? Anyone know one other type of conch we have other than the queen conch? Lamb conch. Lamb conch, absolutely, okay? We have lamb conchs, horse conchs, it's a bunch of different types, but the queen conch is the one we prize the most, okay? It is one of the larger of the marine sea snails. Okay? Now we all know that meat to be nice and sweet, but they go through a process, something like amphibians and insects do, which we call metamorphosis. Okay, That's a life cycle that they change their physical appearance over a period of time. See, as kids into adults, we pretty much have the same anatomy, right? We have hands and legs and feet and head and eyes and stuff like that. We pretty much look the same, you're just a little version of a bigger version of us. But with conchs and frogs and different animals, they go through extreme physical changes, okay? So the conch will start off in a, what we call an accordion sack, okay? So I'll draw one of those for you so you can see what it looks like. If you ever see one of these, I'm sure, living in West End, you guys are very well oriented with the sea. I'm sure all of you have been in the sea at least once, right? Right? 
Okay. Now, <laughs> there's a, a little sack that you will find that contains the eggs of the cone, the queen cone. Okay? This sack is called a uh, benthic egg sack. Benthic simply refers to the zone that you find the conks in, okay? So this egg sac or accordion sac, the conk, the mature female conk will lay this sac in the sandy area, okay? Now this sac will contain many, many babies. Can any of you give me just a rough idea of how much babies you think the sac, and this is, in, this is slightly larger than it actually is, so it's close to the size of it. How much sac? Let me get someone in and answer before. Just a rough guess. 20? 20 to 55, 100, 70, 12, okay. All very good answers, but you know we're close, okay. We got to go upwards, way upwards. One more guess. 1,000 times that by 500. 500,000 babies, okay. 500,000 babies. Imagine tiny little eggs. So many of them inside this sack that it can hold 500,000. If you can imagine, these are very small eggs, right? Mm -hmm. Now, 500,000 babies, why, pray tell, would a comp need to have so many babies? They need to have so many babies because it ensures their chance of survival, okay? If you're a lion, right? A lion will probably have maybe three or four cubs because a lion is what we consider an apex predator, okay? It's a very strong, hunter type of animal. Conks are more, they rely more on defense than offense, okay? So as a conch, it relies on certain means to protect itself. One of those means of protecting itself outside of its shell would be the amount of young that it can produce, okay? So 500,000 babies times that by three. So in one season, a conch could have, you need a calculator for that probably, right? Yeah, a conch could have that three times, 500,000 babies three times a year. That's tons of babies. And guess what? A very small percentage of them will make it to adulthood. Okay? Um, I wonder, you were talking, right? So how many times does the conch produce just once a year? No, it can do it three times a year. Okay. Yeah, so that's the max. Okay. Yeah, so just imagine that amount of babies laying a sack like this three times a year, 1.5, my math is correct, million little babies, okay? So, just a quick side note. If we take them out of the sea too young, we're gonna cut down significantly their opportunity to reproduce that amount of conks. So where, you see those big piles of conks up by the shoreline, right? If we're taking the conks out of the water with that amount, every time fishermen go out, you know, and we're possibly getting what we call rollers, little small juvenile conks, we're significantly reducing their opportunity to reproduce 1.5 million babies, okay? So it's very important that we don't do that. Now this is just the first stage of their life, okay? After this stage, they will go down to what we call the Bellinger stage, okay? Uh, planktonic, planktonic, sorry, uh, larval stage is a stage where this thing will take a journey, okay? They start life in the benthic zone where they're in their area, but then when they turn into these little babies, tiny little babies, very, very small, they will form what we call bellagers, uh, uh, sorry, lobes. Uh, the, the, the actual first metamorphosis is into a bellager, okay? So lobe bellagers will go through a process where they go from two lobes to four lobes to six lobes. Lobes will get bigger. And at that point, um, are they, are they at that point? Um, we call them plankatonic uh, because they're basically Feeding, similar to how the smaller creatures in the water would. So, uh, they. Have you any questions? Yeah, I was wondering, like, for the egg, they go to the plankton, they go to the plankton stage, or they become. Plankton. Yeah, they become bellagers, uh, and they go into the pelagic zone. So, the pelagic zone is out in the open water, so they'll go floating. So, yeah, sim similar to plankton, they will float freely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what that refers to. They are free-floating nature at very small size. Again, this isn't the scale. Microscopic, very tiny, floating in the open water, okay? Just slowly feeding. It's another phase of their metamorphosis. Then we'll move over to where they will then 
bury themselves in the sand. Okay, so before, this is before they get the shell. Okay, this creature is unrecognizable at the biologist stage until they bury themselves into the sand and start building that shell. Now, I left the shells in the car. I don't know if I can shoot really quickly from them. I know you've all seen a conch shell before, but it's really, let me draw, let me draw. All right, so, it's very crude drawing, so give me. That looks like a cup, right? Cup shell. Yeah. So this shell is made out of calcium carbonate, okay? That's what the Bahamas is made out of. The limestone that we're standing on right now, you break it down into tiny little particles, we consider those calcium carbonate, and they'll build that shell. So in this phase, after the pelagic villager stage, they will go into the sand and start to build that shell. So the first stage of building that shell, when they emerge from out of the sand, they'll usually hunt at night. So we call creatures that hunt at night, or feed, sorry, at night, not hunt, feed at night nocturnal versus diurnal, which is daytime feeding, all right? So, thank you, thank you. All right, so this shell right here, takes them a long time to build a shell this size, okay? And if you look at it, this almost feels like the same material that the limestone is made out of, because technically it is, okay? With a mixture of other proteins, we'll get into that later, okay? So, they go and they form a tiny little shell, you know, about one millimeter in length, very small, and they're building that shell over time. So, this period here, the pelagic phase, that's three, three weeks or so, they're floating, as a free-floating villager in the pelagic zone, and then uh, they'll go into the, the sand to build the shell, okay? Now, after they build that shell to a certain size, they'll go into a phase where it's a little bit bigger, okay? And you get the gist. They'll eventually continue to build and build and build until they reach this size, okay? Now, the male is traditionally smaller than the female, okay? So when you get a female queen conch, they're all called queen conchs, but there's a male and a female, of course. The male is smaller. So sometimes you'll see a small shell, but it'll have a thick lip. That means that sh that male is mature. However, he is smaller than the female is. So usually, in nature, the female sometimes has to be bigger because she has to carry the young, okay? So big conch, uh, relatively smaller male, but we can tell that he's mature based on the thickness of the lip as well as the female the thickness and a well-defined lip, okay? So, this conch was close to maturity. And although it's very big, more than likely it's a female, we still would consider this a juvenile. Anyone know why? Give it a guess. not necessarily this bigger conch, but because the lip is broken. If the lip could be broken so easily and it's not completely flared out, it's it's not quite an adult yet. Adults we look forward to do fishing would have a thicker lip and a more flared lip, okay? So if you could break, you could chip the side, it's not really matures yet, okay? So that's an issue that we have with fishermen. We want them to get the well-formed, thick lip so we know the conch is produced at least once or twice already, okay? So this full metamorphosis, these two will get together and they will then form this. So you see that? Different phases, different sizes, it's full transformation, okay? And one section happens in the benthic and the other happens in the pelagic, okay? So any questions so far? How big can it get? Uh, well, we consider a uh, mature conch 180 millimeters and bigger. Millimeters are small, but it's hard to put a size on them because how adults come in different sizes, conchs come in different sizes, but our um, adult size and up would be at 180 millimeters. Okay, so, yeah, like I said, they come in different sizes, but it's more we determine their uh, adulthood from the thickness and the, well, flared lip. Okay. All right, so that has to do with their phases. Now, conch, 
we don't eat every part of the conch. The conch has to be processed in a certain way to remove parts that we don't eat. You know, we don't eat the, the guts and the operculum or anything like that. We usually eat the white part, that thick, white, meaty part that's nice and sweet, right? So there's means in which you want to get rid of the shells. The lily shells are very, very valuable in a lot of other countries in the world. We have not really capitalized on the possibilities uh, that are held in the shell. Many, many different purposes, construction and so forth. But because we prize the meat, you know, the shell is oftentimes discarded. So it's important that the shells are discarded in the correct way, okay? And we now have an area, a designated area, to dump the shells. So if your parents do conking or anything like that, you want to make sure they dump the shells in the designated area. Anyone know where it is? By the fishing hole road, you know the bridge? There's an area that has been designated for the dumping of the shells. That would be a good location to dump the shells because we don't want to just throw them anywhere. They could be unsightly, but also they can harbor a lot of pests, okay? And we all know rats and different stuff. There's a lot of um, organic matter that breaks down, putrefies, and turns into a nasty, uh, biological soupy matter that smells really bad. You know, we have passed conch shell piles before and it smells really bad. We want to avoid all of that so it's necessary to dump them in the correct location, okay? All right. Now, a little into how these shells are made, right? Conks produce a, a certain type of protein that they mix with the calcium carbonate that's just free floating in the ocean, all right, called knacker. When they mix that with the calcium carbonate, they sort of graft a shell for themselves. And this uh, flaky part right here, that's like a soft tissue, a semi-permeable membrane that allows the particles to be drawn in and solidify and expand that membrane. So they keep growing that membrane and they keep layering calcium carbonate. So the older the conch gets, the thicker it gets. All right? Anyone have an idea of how long a conch could live for? Hmm? Yeah. 50 years? That's a little high. Uh, we max them at around 30. The average life of a conch is seven years, but on the up end of things, if he has a nice, if she has a nice healthy life, they can push it to 30 years old. Okay, so imagine how thick a 30-year-old conch shell would be. It'd be super thick. That would be the perfect deterrence for predators. Now, there are some predators that have the ability to break the shell. Can anyone name me any possible predators of the conch? Uh, Tiger shark, yeah, they have to shred their jaws of the power to break, yeah. Crab? Crab, yeah, they have claws and they have the ability to sort of get out of conch, although they're not like apex, they're not something that the conch has to be terrified of. I would put tiger sharks up there. Turtles, you know, a turtle, yeah, turtles have very strong jaws. They have the ability to break a shell. And believe it or not, starfish, starfish. Yeah. Starfish do a lot of weird things. I mean, I don't want to deviate too much from the punk, but a starfish is a pretty cool creature. For a creature that doesn't have a heart and a brain, you know, they can do some pretty clever tricks, like regurgitating their stomach and enveloping any prey, and using the acids in their stomach to dissolve the prey, and they have a little straw mechanism that they suck up the juices that they've dissolved the meat with, and then they bring their stomach back into the body, okay? Pretty cool, right? Yeah, so they wanted to predators too. Okay? Alright, so conks need to rely on their defense, their shell, uh, their ability to get into that shell and hide themselves. Some conks even have the ability to submerge themselves. That's why you don't see as many species as you see. The queen conks usually on the top of the sand and the benthic zone, but you also have uh, queen and king's helmets conks that have the ability to bury themselves, all right? So they have many methods of camouflage or hiding themselves, covering up so they don't get eaten by predators, all right? You even have some conks that eat other conks. So some of the queen conk has to worry about its own kind eating it, not the exact same species, but other types of conk actually prey on the conk itself, all right? Some of them, this conk, the queen conk is a herbivore, but some conks are actually Carnivores, okay? Any questions?
That's a good question. That's what I was trying to remember. I'm glad you said it. How does a pearl get in the cup? It's very similar. Um, clams, like clams, you know, we know clams and oysters for making pearls. Uh, they're known as bivalves, but they're basically sea snails as well, mollusks as well. They basically form a coating over uh, irritant that gets inside them. So inside the clam or the oyster or the conch, this very soft tissue. Now this shell is a form of defense. Now the things happen, you can either get a little sand beneath in an area that's very sensitive to them. They'll form that same protein that I was telling you about that makes the conch of this like shiny smooth iridescence to it. They'll form that same material over the irritant that's in that shell to coat it so it's not as irritating. So sometimes if you're lucky, you take the conch out of the shell, you'll find a nice beautiful pearl that ranges from the color brown to pink to deep red, okay? And that all has to do with the different, different factors. They're not all gonna come out the same color, but that's how the pearl is produced. Basically, an irritant that gets in between the shell and the soft tissue, and they need to smooth it out so it doesn't scrape them. Okay, it's a very good question. Let's see if any more questions. That's pretty much.